thank you for the introduction and thank you for Professor Palmer and all of the Psi Beta Club that invited me to be here tonight. I'm so excited to see all of you. Um, thank you all. What a wonderful turnout. Thanks for coming out at 7 p.m. on a smack in the middle of the week Wednesday night. I really appreciate all of you. Happy to see some familiar faces and lots of new ones. Um, so like Emma said, I'm, a, I'm Amrith Weiss. I'm a residential faculty member in cultural anthropology here at Mesa. And so my talk is called Cross-Cultural Variations in Psychology. And I approach this from a cultural anthropology perspective. It's a little bit different from the perspectives that some of you might be used to taking if you're doing psychology research, but we address a lot of the same questions. So let me tell you a little bit about our topics. And I want to start with a bit of a content note. Because, as some of you who take my classes know, uh, the brain is a predictive organ, according to Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. We read her work sometimes in my class, and hopefully I'm not misstating this for the psychologists in the audience, but she says that our brain is wired to more successfully predict than just react blindly to information. And we illustrate this by looking at some doodles. So if you're an ASB 214, um, you know what this is a doodle of but the rest of you probably don't know. So ask yourself in your head, what looks like, what is, what is this picture? What is going on here? And if you're an ASB 214, do you remember what this is a picture of? Someone shout it out. It's a spider doing a handstand. <laughs> did anybody guess? Let's try another one. Ask yourself in your head, what does this look like to me? I'm going to tell you, to me, it looks like a spigot or some sort of, sort of like a faucet coming out the side of a building. It is not that. Is it a face? It's an elephant tail. Ooh, that's a good guess, Tom. <laughs> Who's an ASB 214 and remembers what this is? It looks like a lion and a calendar. No, that's a good guess, though, because we usually do have this Mayan dates written up from Dr. Costin in our room. It's the it's a submarine going over a waterfall. <laughs> Come on, you guys. I know you guys got this one. What is it? A volcano. Volcano. Good guess. So close. Ice and ridges. A ski jump. So you're the skier. You are looking down at your skis. Over here, you see the slope you're about to go down, and hopefully, all of those little dots, those people, will stay out of your way. <laughs> So now that we've had a bit of a framework for what we're about to see and what we're about to interpret, our brain did not have to do as much work as it might have had to do to decipher. What are we looking at here? And so in the spirit of that, not because I think that you are not resilient, but because I know that you are, I just want to give a content note. We will be talking about some of the content of this lecture involves folks' experiences with hallucination and mental illness in different parts of the world, mostly their feelings and attitudes towards their experiences of hallucination, not as much graphic detail about what they're seeing, but some patterns we see cross-culturally in hallucination. So just be aware of that. We'll get to that at the very end, but we're going to start by talking about uh, cross-cultural variations in cognition, perception, and the experience of emotion. To start with a couple of tools, because I think one of my, my anthropological tools that I'm here to provide you with before we get started has just been unpacked with uh, the idea of like a schema. Some of you might have heard about this in psychology. And again, I hope I'm employing this consistently with what you've learned. In uh, psychological anthropology, we use the term cultural schema. And that's kind of like a model or a framework, some sort of a conceptual tool you can use in your mind to help you interpret what you're about to perceive. And while everyone has different schemata, they can be strongly shaped by what sorts of messages and ideologies we've learned as membership to our cultural group. And so for those of you who take my classes in anthropology of religion, for example, you might know this better as the term cosmology. We use this term in my class quite a bit. I'm probably going to use this term a lot in this lecture. So this is kind of what cosmology is. In physics, you might have heard this term cosmology. It's like the study of the cosmos. In anthropology, it means something a little bit more broad. And it's kind of a person's worldview or kind of the, the structuring um, perception of the general order of the universe, how it's put together, how do things in the universe relate with each other. If you close your eyes, you maybe picture your cosmology. How is the world shaped? How is the universe shaped? How is the universe situated, or how's the world situated in the greater universe, for example? Or how are humans situated on Earth? 
How do humans relate to metaphysical or supernatural beings? What supernatural beings are there? Are they spirits? Are they deities? Do they exist in the same plane as us or somewhere else? What are their names? Where are they? And when I die, will I meet them? What will happen to me after I pass away? How do I relate to other beings on Earth, other non-human species? How is time shaped? How does time move? Is it cyclical? Is it linear? Is it something else? Is time like a bunch of islands that exist kind of in one big sea? These are all examples of ways of thinking about time, thinking about the afterlife in different parts of the world. So your answers to these questions and many more make up your cosmology. We use this term a lot in anthropology. And while every individual has their own cosmology, their own sense of the worldview, how is the universe put together? There are strong cultural patterns. There are strong patterns that within the same cultural group, when we've learned sort of from the same knowledge tradition, we'll probably have similar cosmologies to others in our own communities. So some examples of cosmology, if you're in my class, I probably asked you to draw yours. Um, again, these, these images only really scratch the surface of the level of nuance in everybody's cosmology and everybody's worldview. But these are some illustrations of worldviews or cosmologies from Bali and from Tibetan Buddhism. In Bali, in the local religion, Agama Tirtha, I'll talk, talk to you more about this religion later because I do talk about Bali quite a bit. Um, the mountains, there's a mountain at the very, very top. There's basically, it's an inactive volcano on Bali. That's kind of the life force because it has this very mineral rich water in a crater lake and it flows down the mountain and that's at the top of the mountain where the water goddess resides. Down here on the land is where humans and animals reside. Under the sea, or perhaps in an underworld, depending on who you ask, are malevolent spirits. There's Rangda, who's kind of the queen or goddess of the witches or malevolent people on Earth. And they live kind of down here. So that could be one conception of how is the, the world put together and how do all these different physical and metaphysical planes kind of relate. Um, on the right, you see a, a Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist particularly, uh, Vajrayana Buddhism practiced in Tibet, Wheel of Life and Rebirth. These are some different possible lives or afterlives that you could have. If you pass away, could be reincarnated. You might also not have enough merit earned for you in your lifetime by your loved ones or by yourself to be reincarnated just yet. You might go into a realm of ghosts or hungry ghosts. You can't be reincarnated yet until someone that you know in your lifetime earns merit for you, does something to earn you some karma, some good credit, so that you can then be reincarnated into a new life. If I have an idea that time moves cyclically, if I have an idea that I'll be reincarnated one day, if I understand the concept of a hungry ghost, that would really influence the way that I interact and have conversations with other people. Maybe there are media portrayals that involve things like hungry ghosts as characters in films. I know for a fact there aren't. And a lot of Buddhist, Thai Buddhist and Tibetan Buddhist uh, located uh, films and, and TV shows. Even if someone doesn't identify themselves as religious, they're not, they don't say they're a practicing Buddhist, they might have some sense of Buddhist cosmology and that shapes how they interpret the world. So these are kind of schematic. They are locally based frames of reference. When I interpret the world around me, it's in, it's in my context, whatever my context is. It's in the context of my cosmology. So I've, I've started to unpack my anthropological toolkit, and I just have a couple of more tools to share with you before we get into our main content. And this is coming from within our subfield of cultural anthropology. So like I said, I'm trained as an anthropologist, and anthropology is a discipline with four main subfields that we sort of subdivide our discipline into in the United States. In the United States in particular, we do this. Um, and then within each of these subfields, we have way, way, way more mini fields, <laughs> sub subfields of specializations that folks can hold. Anthro meaning humans, ology meaning the study of, anthropology is the study of all things human. We try to study the human experience from as holistic a perspective as possible. So from a biological perspective, from an archeological perspective, from a linguistic perspective, and from a cultural perspective. And within cultural anthropology, my field, we have several subfields. And these include what I'll talk about today, medical anthropology. Um, medical anthropologists often do ethnographic field work. I have uh, loaded up here ethnographic methods. Let me see if I can use the laser. Yeah. 
Ethnographic methods are kind of the key research methods used by cultural anthropologists. And these involve spending an extended period of time participating with a community that you want to learn more about, you want to advocate for. Maybe it's even your own community. But you want to ask some questions, some critical questions. What's going on here? So maybe a medical anthropologist is uh, spending time with a community they're not part of, but they might also be spending time with a community of medical um, people who are diagnosed with like maybe something that they're diagnosed with, for example. You know, maybe if I have a diagnosis, I'm interested in studying everyone with my diagnosis's experience of healthcare in my community. That could be a question a medical anthropologist might ask. And that's actually some, some questions that I've asked in some of my work before. We also have cognitive anthropology or psychological anthropology, which asks the question of how do our cognitive processes vary across cultural context and based on what language we speak. So these are some of the tools that we're going to use today. Similar questions you might ask in, in psychology and culture, but the research methods we use might just be slightly different. We're most interested in the question of not exactly how these processes work neurologically, so forgive me if I overstep and maybe uh, don't explain some of those things as thoroughly as I could, but what we're really interested in is cultural anthropologists is, local narratives of experiences of having a brain. What does it mean when I see things that other people don't? Why is this happening, for example? And people's lived experiences of those kinds of categories, you know, having emotions, having visions, hearing voices, seeing colors, moving through space and time. How do we experience those things? What are lived experiences? So we would, we would call that the emic perspective or looking at the local perspective on psychology, on people's experiences of thinking and processing and feeling. And we're also interested in a culturally relativist approach. So this is to say that when we look across cultural contexts, we recognize that there's no one that's superior or inferior. We have to understand every like, people's lived experiences in the context of their cosmology and their culture, their language, their unique experiences. So now that I've unpacked my anthropological toolkit, these are the key questions I'd like to answer for the rest of my time with you today. Question one is, uh, how does perception and cognition vary across cultures, particularly with regard to color perception, time and space perception? Uh, when people organize this information in their heads, what's different based on cultural context and the language that they speak? Does this actually mean people are perceiving differently? or are there only differences in how people organize the information? Next question, if we have time for all these questions, how does the expression of emotion vary across cultures? A couple examples of that. Are there universal emotions after all? And maybe people have universal feelings, but they ex what, what time and context you should express emotions. Maybe that's quite different. Third question, this is where we talk a little bit about hallucination, when people see things that others don't. What does it mean in local context? Is it a sickness? What is the name of that sickness? What's the source of it? Maybe it's not a sickness, maybe it's a gift. Maybe it's something else. And then at the end, we'll wrap up by asking, how do we explain all these variations and why does this matter? We've just spent an hour and a half talking about anthropology, but how can we apply this? And I hope that we all can in our own ways. At the end, we'll have hopefully 15 to 30 minutes of time for a Q&A and discussion. So I would appreciate if you write down questions you have and just thoughts, if you have any clarifications or nuances to add, and uh, we'll get to some Q&A at the end. So first, my first question for you is a warm-up question. Uh, which of these things is not like the other? There is a color tile here that just is simply not the same as all of the colors. Can you tell which one? People are kind of pointing up towards me. The top left. <laughs> now we can can we see it a little bit more clearly? Yeah. Okay. So what colors are these? We have green, we have blue. Okay. In the English language, these are called green and blue. But if you spoke Ochi Himba, the language of the Himba people of Namibia, and this is their traditional land you would have much more quickly answered the first slide and Ochihamba speakers actually took more time to answer the question on the second slide which color tile is different 
more time than English speakers, I should say. I should contextualize um, in a comparative study. And this is not because, I should just get this out of the way up front, we don't have time to get into the biology explanations, but it's not a biological reason. Humans are one of the more genetically homogenous species on Earth. We do not have significant enough genetic differences from one ethnic group to another to say, well, the HIPAA just see color differently. They have different retinas or they have different brains. No, that's not what's happening. It's not biological. So what's going on? What's the answer to this question? Why did HIPAA speakers differentiate the first wheel more quickly than the second wheel? And we as English speakers, for the most part, differentiated the second wheel more quickly. Well, as it turns out, color occurs naturally in nature, but color categories are not naturally occurring, per se. Color categories differ a lot based on who made the color categories. How we divide up the color wheel is quite different based on what language we speak. For example, here's the color spectrum. How English speakers would often divide up the spectrum is different from Jahai speakers on the Malay Peninsula, for example. And so it goes with most languages. There's, there's different ways of dividing up the color wheel in every language. In the Russian language, these colors have different names, Golovoy and Sini. So some of you might have heard of this, um, oh, and I should say it in Japanese, like these, all of these shades uh, have one name. And some of you might have heard of this uh, psychologist this, and linguist, principally she's a linguist named Lyra Boroditsky. Uh, some people say that um, she's my doppelganger. I wish <laughs> that I was accomplished this. She speaks five languages. She's about 20 years of experience in this field. And she has an article among several articles called Does Language Shape Thought? She explores the question, does the language we speak shape the way we think? Some of you might have heard this question formulated as the superior work hypothesis. And some of your instructors might have mixed feelings about it. So does Dr. Borodinsky. But some of her work involves looking at what's going on in somebody's brain. And again, I can't tell you exactly what's the parts of the brain or what it is, but they're wearing an fMRI headband while people speaking different languages are looking at different colors. And the color cards are changing and the color cards are changing. And for English speakers, when this color card comes on and then this color card comes on, there's no reaction of real surprise. Because in the words of Borodinsky, Nothing's categorically changing. But for Russian speakers, there's a surprise reaction because something is changing between categories here. A different way of dividing up the color wheel in different languages. And Borodinsky's work explores things other than just color division. They also explore, um, I won't get to gender and culpability as much, but as you know, many languages, many of you are bilingual, multilingual, beyond bilingual. You know that some languages have, have grammatical gender, some don't. Um, some have constructions like in English, which is kind of uncommon actually to say, I broke my arm. I broke my leg when it was an accident. Many languages, like even, you know, if you speak Spanish, for example, the construction doesn't really indicate that you broke it. It's that it broke, it broke itself. So sometimes even the legal ramifications of this can be people are more likely to remember who did something. If it was an accident in English than in Spanish. But what I want to show you guys a little bit more is some of her studies on time and directional orientation. People knowing what cardinal direction they're facing. Do you guys know what cardinal direction you're facing right now? East. And this is SC11 East. Nice. Nice one. Okay. So, in Boroditsky's work, um, she works with English speakers, speakers of Mandarin Chinese. Also, some of her work has taken place in um, the uh, western side of Cape York, you can see in the continent of Australia there. This is traditional land called Pomparao. Um, the traditional owners of the land are the Tyre people. They speak a language called Kuk Tyre. And Kuk Tyre, there are no words for left and right, forward and backward. There are cardinal directions. There are 16 words for cardinal directions. So you have to stay oriented quite well to be able to say, I broke my, my northwest arm. Or, you know, there's a, you know, move, move your back to the southwest or something like that. She asks people to uh, orient events. And this is also a real meta question because you'll notice the events are there's an egg. There's a chick and there's a chicken. So you also have to comment on which came first, the chicken or the egg, to be able to successfully answer this question. 
and she asked people to organize events on a timeline from earliest to latest, and depending on the language spoken, people were organizing the timeline in really different directions. English speakers were commonly writing uh, left to right, like our writing direction. Arabic speakers from right to left, like their writing direction. But some folks were writing in a cyclical pattern. Some folks were writing from top to bottom. Mandarin Chinese speakers have time flowing from the heavens all the way down through the earth. And Kuk Tire speakers were always organizing events from east to west. Didn't matter where they're facing, where their bodies are oriented. If I was facing, I'm facing west right now, I guess, so time would go away from me. And um, if I were facing this way, then time would go this way. So time is, time is always going east to west. So possibly some pretty strong evidence that the language we speak shapes the way we think. I won't get into the whole history of the superior morph hypothesis, but at the foundation of this hypothesis, two different authors, who, they weren't really collaborating with each other, but they were writing about tenseless languages, languages that don't have words like before and after, don't have words like, um, you know, she did, she will do, tenses. And so Sapir and Warf are thinking, well, then maybe people are actually experiencing time differently because their language doesn't address it. And Boroditsky is showing, well, people are really thinking about the, the direction and the shape of time quite differently in, in different linguistic contexts. But there's also been a counterpoint to this hypothesis, and this comes from something called the Tempest Study. You guys might be interested in reading more about this later, because I just only have limited time. But in the Tempest, the Tempest Study, some researchers much more recently than Sapir and Worf uh, put together some videos, and they had pairs of German speakers read the video or watch the videos, and pairs of speakers of Yucatec Maya, tenseless language, watch the videos. And this is their success rate. So basically, in the pairings, one person watches the video, the other person doesn't see it. And the person who watched the video has to explain the order of events to the person who did not watch the video. Now, success is the person who did never see the video can tell you exactly what happened in one word. And here's the success rates. Yucatec speakers, this is all their success. The failure is just a small margin down here, a little less than 20%. German speakers, only a 2 percent less than 2% difference. And there's not a lot of unsuccess. So what's going on here? Are people really experiencing time differently? Maybe they're just talking about it differently, but with equal success. There's something to be said for linguistic relativity, the idea that we think about things differently when we have different linguistic tools to think about them. And if you speak multiple languages, you can probably speak to this. Some things you think about differently in one language than another. But maybe it's not a hard and fast linguistic determinism that would be to say, your language determines your reality. And it seems like people are very innovative in kind of experiencing and, and communicating even when they have very different linguistic tools available to them. So that's kind of my preliminary answer to our first question. And if you have more questions about how folks communicate time in Yucatec Maya without tense, maybe we can answer them at the end, just a little bit. Um, okay, my second question for you today is, how do, uh, do people in different cultural contexts express or experience emotion differently? Are there universal expressions of emotion? So let's start with a really short little TED Ed video that attempts to answer this question. Basically, some folks, earlier scholars, anthropologists, for example, are thinking pretty strong proponents that most behaviors are learned behaviors. So emotional expressions probably are no exception. But some of you have read about Sylvan Tompkins, sort of mid mid-century um, theorist. Not sure your thoughts about his work, but he was thinking, I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure if emotional expression is always a learned behavior. Because he's thinking, well, human emotional expressions like facial expressions, laughter, quite similar to non-human mammals. So let's see what we have to say. I'm going to play a short video. Very interesting. And I am resisting the urge to have a group discussion right now. <laughs> My personal thoughts is, wow, when I first learned about this, um, I thought it was really interesting how those who had been blind since birth and sighted folks were having really comparable facial expressions in response to similar stimuli. 
This isn't to say that we can't learn facial expressions. I think that within neurodiverse communities, I've heard a lot of conversations about what it means to learn to express certain facial expressions or to read facial expressions in, in various ways and how our facial expressions do vary quite a lot and what they mean to different people. But there's also some biological basis to some of these, these emotional states and affects, expressions of emotional states. And uh, we talk about affect theory in a particular way in cultural anthropology as kind of a, a relationship between uh, our culture and our, our affective state and how we can feel this embodied affective feelings of disgust or fear or attraction. I don't know if attraction is really affective, but we can feel these visceral feelings and they can be influenced by things that for somebody else in a different cultural context, they wouldn't feel the same way. For example, if we grew up eating beef, that might sound delicious, I'm gonna eat a burger. But if we grew up in a cultural context where it's taboo to eat beef or it's taboo to eat beef mixed with cheese, I might be feeling really disgusted to hear that I'm gonna be eating that. Um, if I grew up eating this delicious uh, bumblebees and scallions, sounds yummy. Some of you just had a physical reaction. <laughs> you didn't choose to have that reaction. But if you were raised eating that dish, you would have likely had a different physical reaction. Varies by individual, but also culturally influenced. Uh, only about 50% of uh, societies around the world find kissing on the mouth to be romantic activity. You might feel intrinsically attracted to the idea of that, or you might feel disgusted. This can depend on personal factors. It can also depend on cultural context. One emotion I want to talk about is anger. How do people express anger? In what context is it acceptable to express anger? Because maybe around the world, everyone's, they've got the, the capacity to feel anger. The Inuit, are no exception. The Inuit live in above the Arctic Circle, Alaska, Canada, Greenland. Inuit are not born without the capacity to feel anger. Yet, it's taboo in Inuit society to show outwardly a scowl, uh, hitting or, or punching somebody in anger, um, yelling at somebody in anger, especially a child. It's taboo. You don't talk about that. You don't do it. It's not socially acceptable to do that. So again, this isn't a it isn't born. People don't have a capacity for anger. So how are Inuit parents teaching kids when is it appropriate to show anger and, and in what ways? So this is a Mina Ishlatuk, who is an Inuit parenting specialist. There are Inuit parenting classes taught at many colleges locally up in Alaska, north northwestern uh, Canada. And she teaches some of these classes. So these are some of the strategies. Inuit parenting is based a lot in storytelling. And some of them are really short little stories you can tell a kid. She talks about how when her, her daughter's going towards the ocean, not safe. Don't say, oh, stop, watch out. That's not safe. It's the sea monster is going to get you if you go towards the ocean. Not with a raised voice. So just don't, sea monster, watch out. If you go outside without a hat in the winter, Northern lights are gonna kick your head around like a soccer ball. If you're not listening to your parents, it's probably because you got like too much wax in your ears, you don't like your earwax. You should probably listen to your parents more. But some of the stories are very intricate and complex and they're tailored to the particular child and the event that just happened. So let's say a child hits or the child, you know, bites a kid at school or the child hits the parent or says, I don't like you to the parent. What is she gonna do? Wait for a calm moment and then there's a skit or some sort of a story acted out with some of the adults that show the kid's behavior. What just happened? Now what would you do now that you're calm if you were the character in this story? What would you choose to do? Um, so an anthropologist that was living with the Inuit, actually when my initial attack was a really small kid, told this story about some of her family members, male family members, so like it was like a father and like his sons, sons-in-law, they were all going to go on a fishing trip. And they were all sitting together braiding a fishing line and it took days. They went out on the boat, the fishing line snaps, the first use. No one's expression changes. 
<laughs> Calmly, the oldest man, after a, a beat of silence, says, Okay, let's row back. And let's start writing another fishing line. So it's kind of taboo to yell at kids. It's kind of taboo to show anger in this cultural context. In other cultural contexts, sometimes it is seen as acceptable to yell at a kid. It's not necessarily better in one context or worse than another context. There are several examples, and actually Ova, uh, Ova Himba that we talked about earlier with the, a different color palette than we had. And um, some some other groups in Southwest Africa, uh, Ova Mbundu, and we talk about Jutwasi or Kung in my class sometimes. People in, in Southwestern Africa, there's a lot of taboos locally there where you should not get angry at a kid because you have no sense. If you have anger at a kid, there hasn't their sense hasn't come to them yet. So if you get caught showing anger at a kid, that's it's not inappropriate to be angry, but it's appropriate to respond to a kid that way. That's not an appropriate source of anger in that context. Now, in the Marquesas Islands in the South Pacific, it's completely acceptable to show your anger towards a child. Cultural relativism in different cultural contexts, what's an appropriate time to be angry? It's different. What's an appropriate facial expression to make when you're angry is different. And this can be shown, this would be another fascinating conversation for another day about parenting strategies. Um, I will say that there's a lot of cool things about the parenting strategies that the Inuit use. Um, a psychologist named Dina Weisberg who studies child psychology, she has this, uh, she's coined this term the fantasy advantage. She says that for some learning, not for all kinds of learning, but for, uh, she found like logical kind of reasoning and moral reasoning. Kids seem to learn it better when they're learning about a fantasy character, like the Northern Lights gonna kick my head like a soccer ball. Then they learn when learning from a hyper-realistic story, just don't go in the ocean. Why? Because it's cold, because you get hypothermia, because you could drown. No, the sea monster. And there can be an advantage for kids learning in some ways. Another very cool thing to explore, if you guys have more time, at the very end, I'll put a slide with all of the sources that I referenced. You guys can take a picture. Hopefully, we can email it out if you want to read more later, because I know I'm just scratching the surface of all of this. Hopefully, you're excited to learn more. For my third question, this is where we will be addressing a little bit about people's experiences of hallucination cross-culturally. This is the question, when people see and hear things that others don't, what does it mean? In local context. I'm going to get back hopefully to telling the story about Pak Kareta. His name is Nayamon Kareta. The honorific Pak will refer to him because he's an older Balinese man and that's the honorific that we used to refer to him. He experiences some visions and voices that his wife hear, his kids, they just don't hear in Bali, Indonesia. What does it mean? But first for a little bit of context, Let's think about an altered state of consciousness that many of us experience. A dream state. What are the most common things to see when we see these visions for some of us who remember our dreams? Different parts of the world. Now I'll say this is not a scholarly project. This was a crowd crowdsourced research project. So this is like self-reports and people are self-reporting on a website where they live and what their, their dream was last night. This is the data from almost every country. Let's zoom in. In no particular order. Let's just take a look at it. Yeah, North America. Seems like the European, uh, like uh, English colonies are teeth filling out. Spanish colonies have snakes, ducks, cars, lice, the dead. <laughs> and pleasantly doves in the Bahamas. Here's Europe. Now we'll notice that some areas that colonize these areas, their dreams are about teeth falling out. <laughs> Snake. I don't know. The sea is, the sea is, this is kind of landlocked here. We've got the sea, the sea. Pregnancy. Cat. <laughs> I did ask a colleague who's uh, from a Greek family, and he was able to back up the fact that ha is a salient dream, but not exactly what it meant. So, 
fascinating, but but related to that, not in a tongue in cheek way, but really like I have the teeth falling out dream, but I haven't really grown up with people talking to me about that dream or with the salient cultural story about, you know, if you do this, your your teeth will fall out. But I have that dream. Do you guys have that dream? Yes. It's a pretty common dream. Some people are like, no, you don't have that dream. So something really fascinating is happening here, and I don't think that this is fully explained, but some of your psychology faculty will probably have a better sense of this than I do, about what's going on, how is, how is our culture accessing our subconscious mind? Maybe and we certainly don't choose what to dream. And we might not even consciously talk about these topics. We have patterns in dreaming similarly to our neighbors, Middle East and Central Asia. They got a lot of snakes. <laughs> Cutting hair in areas where it's uh, taboo for some folks to show their hair. It makes some sense. It all makes sense. I just can't explain all of it. Got fish. We have a lot of lice, mice, rats, and snakes. <laughs> What's your most common dream? I don't know. Tell your neighbor. What did you dream about last night? Yeah, what did you the African continent has the most ethnic and linguistic diversity of any continent with humans and seems to have the most diversity in different patterns in dreams. Squirrels over in Namibia, so the Himba may be dreaming about squirrels, so there's lots and lots of ethnic groups in Namibia, so it's hard to say. Stairs. You've got Southeast Asia and Australia. Death and Similarly, <laughs> similarly to how our uh, we don't choose to have dreams, we don't choose what our some of us have the gift to choose what our dreams will be, but most of us don't don't choose that. We still see these patterns. So do we if we have hallucinations, if we induce them by taking hallucinogenic substance, or if we have them as part of how our body is put together. We don't likely choose what will be the context and the content of our hallucinations. That would be reductive to say, because some folks uh, do have some, would probably feel as though they, they can make some, some manifestations or some conscious influences. But for the most part, you know, we're not, we're not necessarily choosing what we see. And yet there are cross-cultural patterns in what people see and hear when they see and hear things that others don't. There are cross-cultural patterns in the attitudes people have, the experiences they have of their hallucinations, whether it's a very positive, very negative, kind of ambivalent relationship with those voices and visions. And there's this anthropologist named Tanya Lerman. You might be interested in reading her, her relatively recent book from 2016. It's called Our Most Troubling Madness, uh, Case Studies in Schizophrenia Across Cultures. And she traveled with, and this is what medical anthropologists often do, they travel with people who are trained in Western medicine. Bless you, bless you. And they, they ask, they often know local languages, they often are kind of cultural brokers, they help translate ideas between local populations and doctors who really don't have that local context. So this is kind of what she did. She traveled to the United States, she traveled to, I think, California, and she traveled to uh, Chennai in India, in Southeast India, the Tamil city. And she traveled to Ghana, Accra, Ghana. And she saw some patterns in how people experience, particularly these were folks who were diagnosed with schizophrenia by psychiatrists she traveled with, according to very 
locally Western DSM criteria. Um, this is not the only cause of hallucinations. You know, someone could have a brain tumor or something else is going on. These are folks particularly diagnosed with this condition. And now, some of you all, hopefully this is as up-to-date as this could be. Um, she says that there's not a particular gene, like one single gene that is identified as being associated with schizophrenia, but maybe a number of genes. Not 100% not sure right now, but it seems like there are epigenetic factors that is factors in the environment that act on our genes. These can be factors in our social environment. These can be factors in our, um, in our physical environment that actually influence the way that we express our genes. An example of that is uh, what we eat can influence whether or not we might express the predisposition we might have genetically to have type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance one day. Um, this is an oversimplified explanation, but in the environment, again, the social environment, just as much as the physical and uh, ecological environment, there might be factors that cause someone who might have a predisposition to see and hear things that others don't to start having those symptoms. And some of those risk factors, some of those epigenetic factors could be uh, going through a very traumatic event, a very stressful event. Some of this trauma could be over the course of time. It could be because someone had been displaced uh, forcibly or, or not forcibly and through immigration or possibly experiencing new poverty or racism situation. And this is kind of the hypothesis as to what happened in this kind of unusual case. In migrants from Suriname to the Netherlands in the late 1980s, early 1990s, Seems like the distribution of those who hear and see things that others don't is pretty equal worldwide. But sometimes there's this concentration of a really high rate of diagnosis of schizophrenia or a really high rate of people maybe not diagnosed but, but seeing and hearing things that others don't. And one example was a population that migrated from the Dutch colony of Suriname in the northern part of South America here to uh, the Netherlands who had colonized this area. They, there was like a a program where people could migrate back to the Netherlands in the late 80s and early 90s. And a lot of folks, once they got to the Netherlands, started to have hallucinations where they had not before. And the question is, what's going on? Is it is it environmental? Is there something in the air, in the water in the Netherlands? Probably not, because there are Dutch neighbors who were not migrants. We're not experiencing increased rates of schizophrenia diagnosis. But then it could also be the question of, is it something to do with their families in Suriname? But their families who stayed back in Suriname were not having higher rates of schizophrenia diagnosis either. So what might have happened? I don't think this is thoroughly explained, but the hypothesis is that these epigenetic factors acted on those who might have had some risk of expressing the trait. They went through something very traumatic and uh, at a higher rate than others in their community started to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. So Tanya Lerman travels to the US, she travels to Ghana, India, and then I'm gonna talk about Bali as well, but this is outside of her study. When she goes to the US, Ghana, and India, she sees, uh, she's gonna write about some general patterns that she sees. So this doesn't explain every single individual's experience with the visions and voices, but it does explain some patterns that she saw. And when she was in the United States, she was asking people, you know, who are these people that you're hearing? And people in the US were more likely to say they didn't recognize whoever they were hearing. It was a God. It was um, maybe if they, if they recognized who it was, maybe it was a stranger or a celebrity. This probably does not describe every single person in the US, but this was a big pattern that she saw. This certainly doesn't describe everybody. She also asked people in the US, like, what are your thoughts? What are your feelings? And this is a slide that comes from her. This is a transcript of some of her interviews. She said, um, people in the US were saying, well, I don't tell people that I'm hearing voices. I don't want to be stigmatized. I don't want to be called crazy. I don't want to be sent away. No, we're not supposed to talk about mental illness. We're not supposed to have mental illness. If you tell people out there that you have voices, they treat you differently. Don't tell people about my personal life. I think I'll crazy, I'm crazy, they might judge me. 
So what attitudes did she hear from folks in Ghana? Folks in Ghana also were often hearing God. A lot of people in Ghana are Christian. So the Christian God, sometimes we're hearing, but what are the attitudes in Ghana? It was a little bit different. Not all the time was it a positive experience, but some people were feeling possibly like, this is an experience where I might feel chosen. I might feel some comfort from hearing God or an authority figure talking to me. I think I have to scroll ahead a little bit for this, but. Uh, some people might have been thinking that there was a spiritual attack going on. Uh, it was preferable to say, I'm not sick. I've been bewitched. Very salient explanation for social misfortunes in Ghana. Unexplained social problems, unexplained deaths. Um, there's always a social cause. So sometimes there's an explanation. If you've broken a relationship, that's that could be why there's a sickness going on here. And... Um, that that could be translated as witchcraft. So why are you acting like you don't normally act? Why are you acting out of character? Maybe you're bewitched. Sometimes that was preferable to saying, I have schizophrenia. For some people in Ghana, they were sent to, instead of a psychiatric hospital, sent to go to training um, in the local religion to become a local priest called a komfo, which we learned about earlier if you were in ASB 214. And this one person said, I think that my slide's not formatted too well, uh, but that his mother told him, it's not the fact that you hear God, but it's the fact that you would resist God's call that would make you crazy. And in a lot of cultural contexts, there are mentorship networks for people who see and hear things that others don't. Mentorship maybe to become a spiritual leader. And kind of some of our terms that we have available for a spiritual leader, priest, shaman, they're kind of problematic terms, they're kind of overgeneralizing terms. But a lot of times a, a local practitioner, a local spiritual practitioner, must necessarily go into a trance, see and hear things that others don't, in order to be regarded with credibility. So sometimes this is, I'm being chosen. And sometimes then they're in, in a context where there's a lot of support for that. There's a mentorship network. Someone who's older than you who's been through this experience will then train you in a spiritual practice. And it's, it's not that you hear, it's that if you were not mentored properly, you resisted the local narrative. One, one of many local narratives in Ghana is this, this could make you crazy. So Tony Lerman also was looking at some patterns in Chennai in India. And the big theme here is that people are regarding voices that they're hearing as voices of kin, ancestral kin who've passed on, or possibly kin who are even still alive, hearing the voice of a father, for example, or someone familiar in the house, the reminder to wash the dishes or take out the trash or quit smoking were often things that people in Chennai would report hearing their voices say. Um, there was one person who, um, Ganesha, the one of the Hindu deities, uh, hosted her a whole uh, dance party. That does not mean that these are always joyful, positive experiences. Some people were still saying, you know, this, this, I don't necessarily feel angry or like the voices are hostile, but for some folks, this is very exhausting. Still not really wanting to be hearing these voices all the time. So people still seek treatment quite a lot. And oftentimes the treatment in Chennai, as reported by Tanya Lerman, is that the families were coming along with the people who were hearing, even though the families didn't hear and see those things, they were attending treatment along with their relatives. They were more of a, a collective um, understanding of the whole experience, not just who are you hearing, that's family members, but then who is going with you when you go, you're not going away by yourself oftentimes, you're going to treatment with family members. And I'm sure that there are exceptions. There are some exceptions to these reported by Tanya Lerman. So again, these are not uniform experiences. Everyone has the same. But these were really salient patterns, really differed from one cultural context to another, according to her work. I have one other story that I want to tell, and this is a Balinese story. I showed you Pakareta. And Pakareta is the, he, uh, very generously offered to have many of his treatment experiences filmed, 
by a really wonderful anthropologist named Robert Lemelson. You can watch some of his films in MCC Canopy, Canopy with a K. He has a series called Afflictions, where he follows uh, people who live in Bali and Java, two islands on the dis like linguistically distinct groups in Indonesia. They have their own languages, own uh, cosmologies, both in Indonesia. And Pak Kureta lives in Bali. And he was diagnosed with a number of um, a number of local um, conditions, local syndromes. One of these local syndromes is called Yep. Uh, Nyep is something that happens, and the chief symptom is muteness after someone's experienced a fright or a fence or something traumatic has happened to them. The chief symptom is you stop being able to talk for a period of time when you have Nyep. Now, for Pakare to actually, you might see him interviewed if you watch the film, he actually calls Nyep a sickness. In his, his context, he says, I'm sick, I have Nyep. But others in his community say, I'm not ill, I'm Nyep. So in some cases, Nyep and illness can be painted as kind of antithetical to each other. I'm not sick, I'm Nyep. But in any case, the symptoms that go along with Nyep are sometimes seeing and re-seeing whoever has hurt you and muteness. Kapakareta also goes to a local psychiatrist, and he gets diagnosed with PTSD. Over time, he gets diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia because he sees and hears the Wong Samar and Gamang Pamali at all times. And they tell him to do things like uh, get up and put on your, I think he might be wearing it in this picture, um, military uniform from when there was communist occupation, or a communist state, I should say, in Bali. When he was very young, he witnessed some real violence as a result of a local communist militia who really did some violent things to his family. He still sometimes sees some people telling him to go put on his uniform because they're about to enact something similar. But he calls them Wong Samar. Now, if I were to ask everyone in the room, and I won't ask this, don't, don't actually raise your hand, but if I were to ask people in the room, you know, raise your hand if you believe in God, probably a lot of hands would go up. Now, if I were to say, raise your hand if you have personally heard or felt the hand of God, still some hands would probably be up. Some folks who experience maybe feeling the spirit or in a context where, in a ritual context or a spiritual context, you have had that personal relationship with God. But if I were to ask people, you know, do you hear and see God in a way that's not distinguishable from any other person that you see and experience? Not as many hands would go up, probably. <clears throat> and so it is in Balinese cosmology. This comes from traditional um, Agamatirta, the Balinese religion, which I should have put the spelling of that on here. And also Balinese Buddhism, Balinese Hinduism. You can ask most Balinese. Do you acknowledge that there are such spirits as Wong Samar and Gamang Pamali? And most will say, yeah, I acknowledge that. That's part of the local cosmology. Gamang Pamali, they kind of, they're spirits that live in the landscape. So are Wong Samar, but Wong Samar are descended of like a spiritual militia. When Java tried to invade Bali, Bali was successful. They did not get conquered by Javanese. But the idea is that the Wong Samar were then defeated. And now they still, as, as indistinct, defeated spirits. Um, and, and some of these ideas don't translate well across languages. So I'm sure there's a lot of nuance that's missing when we've translated this. But they still live in the Balinese landscape. And how they got there was they were. Um, a spiritual militia. So they have this kind of militant properties. And people say, yeah, I acknowledge that's part of mythology, that's part of cosmology. Have you ever seen or experienced them? Some people will say, well, yeah, maybe in a ritual context, maybe at a, a celebration of life or something, remembering a loved one. But Pakureta sees the Wong Samar every day, all the time. They appear to him as these little black apparitions, and they tell him, um, that he should, you know, I, I shouldn't get into specifically what they tell him, but they they kind of behave as part of the militia. So he gets diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia as well when he goes to a local psychiatrist. But then he goes to a couple of local practitioners called the Bali Anusada, 
Aliana Rosada are local healers in Bali. I'll show you just a short video clip of them to finish. But the Balian, there are a few, there are several different kinds of specializations they can have. One of them gives him some herbal remedies. One of them is a lontar reader. So he reads scriptures, traditional scriptures, and he calls them in his language, he, his word for them is mantras. And he, he has a few different takes. One of them says you have yen. One of them says you've been bewitched. You have Babai Nan, you've been bewitched by those who hurt your family in the past. And then he has a psychiatrist who says that he has schizophrenia. And then they interview <clears throat> Pakarita and they say, um, what treatment did you prefer? Did you prefer the treatment you received from the Balian Usada with herbal remedies or mantras, or did you most prefer the pills given to you by Dr. Suryani here? And here's a video of Dr. Suryani. The diagnosis of schizophrenia is paranoid because the pain is more than three months. But when the last visit to the hospital, even though he says that there is no pain, but if you look at his face, there is no expression. My husband feels like he's a normal person. Periksa bapa tahu ni ke kan selalu merasa tapi je panggil rasaan melekat terkejut. Let's see if we can see the folly on. Here's one. Jawab kedai. Tanya masih. Tanya masih. Tunggu orang samar. Belajar itu belajar 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 muka je. Saya ni saya ni saya nak tahu jam belajar. ก็เราเราเรียนเรียนกันเลยมองไปดูมันตรงเส้นเราดูมันจะวันจะไม่ต้องไล่ก็มันจะเกิดอะไรเป็นเป็นเป็นเป็นเป็นเป็นเป็น
And I'm so happy to see that. Really, that's wonderful. I'd like to leave you all with a tool that comes from a medical anthropologist who's also trained as a, a medical doctor, in particular a psychiatrist named Dr. Arthur Kleinman. And this is a, an instrument of eight questions that Dr. Kleinman thinks we should ask anyone that we meet for helping them with their experience of illness or a mental affliction. Um, Dr. Lomelson uses the term affliction for Pakareta because that's the best translation of his work. What do you call the problem? Yep, schizophrenia, the binon. What do you think caused it? Something that happened when you were younger? Someone bewitched you? Do you think this is a broken relationship? Possibly. Do you think that there's something going on in your brain chemistry? What's your narrative of what caused this illness? Why do you think it started when it did? Pacareta's family is interviewed in the film. They have many different explanations. His brother said it started because he ate contaminated eels out of the rice fields. His wife said he was, he was traumatized by losing one family member. He says it's from another thing. This is, this is salient. We need to understand what is, what is the explanation of why it started when it did. The important part of the illness narrative. What does your sickness do to you? How does it work? An explanation of the sickness works because the spirit of someone who hurt my loved one is inside of me is a very different explanation than the number of different explanations pot create tickets. How severe is the sickness? Do you think it'll have a long or short course? What do you fear most about this sickness? What are the chief problems your sickness has caused, not just physically, but socially? Pakareta had an experience where his wife was not with him for a while because he was not able to communicate. Maybe that's a social problem that his sickness has caused. What kind of treatment do you think he should receive? What results do you want to see from your treatment? And you all might be thinking of even more questions that you'd like to add to this list. Maybe you like to ask people or that you would appreciate being asked. These are some questions that can help us understand someone's, uh, we call illness narrative, Dr. Kleinman calls it an illness narrative, their entire conceptualization of what is causing this illness, what does it mean? What is the treatment that would make me feel at peace? For some families, the treatment is save a life. For some families, the treatment is save the soul. As long as we haven't interrupted what's going to happen to the, the person in their afterlife, then we've had, had a successful treatment. In some societies, it's taboo to artificially prolong the life, for example, like in uh, Toraja, Indonesia, which is kind of neighboring to here. So medical anthropologists sometimes find it important to ask these questions to help understand what is someone's narrative of their illness? How, is, how are they experiencing? What's their lived experience of this? have a video uh, to finish off of what it looks like. Let's see a medical anthropologist at work. This is one of Dr. Lemelson's other films, Kites and Monsters. This takes place in Java, Indonesia, neighboring island to Bali. So a kid, his name is Wayan Yoga. He was diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome and ADHD. These are some of the questions the medical anthropologist asks. Yeah, 
gejala-gejala yang lain itu soal berpikir dia tuh nggak berpikir banyak cuman kalau duduk sendirian bengong dia itu ini oh, jadi berkonsentrasi sedikit tidak normal iya oh, makanya dokter sampai bilang sama saya jangan dikasih dia tuh duduk sendirian sampai bengong gitu nggak oh. boleh itu sebetulnya gitu dokter makanya kalau dia sendirian ini bengong itu nah. dan bagaimana bicara yang, yang oh, masih ya. pernah ke ke juga atau ke Bali ya? Pernah. 
Kalian bilang apa? Tidak ada hasil lah apa Tidak ada hasil? Tidak, dibilang tidak apa-apa gitu Oh iya Makanya ini yang terakhir saya telepon ke Bersarat ini Lalu kelihatan hasilnya begini tuh Tidak penting sekarang Dulunya apa? Itu ya. Dan bagaimana hubungan uh, dengan teman-teman? Biasa Biasa Jawab dan berbaik Pasti main layan Oh iya, itu lainnya dia Itu aja bikin layangan untuk dia itu Apa di sana dia? Itu lagi Yang penting punya hiburan Gak sayang, gak sayang, enggak Wayang masih suka melukas Iya, enggak di malam melukas ya Mbak, itu mbak sama bisa lihat Wow, bagus Ini ini randa, randa. Ya, baru pas dua SD sekarang. Ya. Wan bisa menjelaskan ke ketemu apa siapa ini? Oh, dia dia tinggal di mana? Di mana? Di mana? Oh. Dia melakukan apa? Dia bagus sejauh ini. Dia bantu orang sejauh. Oh, ya. Mengapa? Makan manusia. Dia makan manusia. Hmm. Right. Makan anak bisa. Anak bisa. Orang bisa. Bisa memberitahu kamu cerita tentang. Raksasa, kawan, tak cerita. Waktu dia ke gua, dia melihat seorang anak. Lalu dia menangkap anak itu. Namanya anak itu namanya Gede. Di Gede Pasur. Lalu dia menangkapnya, dia langsung memakannya. So you'll notice some of the questions that Dr. Lundelson, the medical anthropologist, was asking. How's he doing at school? What about making friends? He wants to know about his drawings and what they mean to him. Sort of the social experience of this child, this entire person. And I am grateful and I'm, I'm trusting Dr. Lundelson really does have the thorough consent of Pakareta's family and Wyatt and Yoga's family to share their stories. And I'm very grateful that they did, because this really gives us some insight as medical anthropologists into how to practice, possibly in a more, more ethical and holistic way. Um, medical anthropology and any kind of anthropology is kind of an inherently colonial project. We see the white anthropologist that's gone to Indonesia and is gaining a lot of knowledge from this collaboration and this relationship. The best that we can do is hope to be of service, and hopefully this is what's happening in this interaction. Any reports that I, I've understood is that this, this has a, been a mutual be beneficial reaction, and we can take some guidance from this in any of our conversations to ask questions that really hope to gain people's perspectives as an entire person, not just their experience and illness, but their experience as themselves, as people. And so hopefully some of these tools from um, from medical anthropology, hopefully these eight questions and hopefully some of these understandings, just of the fact that we have such diverse cultural schemata, such diverse models and modes of understanding and interpreting the universe can give you some insight and some, some motivation and interpretation of whoever story you come across, whoever you're serving. Ask them the eight questions if you can. Ask them their story, ask them to understand their local illness narrative. What do you call the problem? Is it a problem at all? Have you maybe been chosen for service as an Okomfo? Maybe the problem is I can't stop hearing my father's voice even though he passed away in 2016. 
Maybe the problem is I can't talk all of a sudden. Maybe the problem is I'm having a problem with my social network. I'm afraid I've alienated some people. What do you call the problem? How do you describe it? Are there spirits that are occupying your every landscape and your every move that are telling you threats? Are there spirits that are giving you positive voices and encouragement? Are there, is there a God that's helping you? Is there a family member that's talking to you? Why do you think it started when it did and so forth? If you have suggestions or you have any further ideas to share, let's, or any reflections on the films, let's open the floor to that. Let's open the floor to questions on anything I said. Like I said, that none of this has been my original research, so I might not be able to thoroughly answer every question, but I'll do my very best to answer questions where we can. Uh, I hope to, to hear some comments, thoughts, questions from you guys tonight, hopefully in the future. Uh, these are some of the readings and videos that I cited. Um, here are some classes. You can come see me if you want to learn a little bit more. And uh, I really thank you guys for being here tonight. Question away. <laughs> or just thoughts. That was a lot. Thank you guys for your, your time and space for this. Yes. It's going to be a little strange, but how much do you know about dimethyltryptamine? Uh, not a ton, but a little bit. So you were talking about cross-cultural shared hallucinations. This is obviously a psychedelic, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of the experiences are shared between cultures or, you know, countries. I've talked to plenty of people who've had yeah. the same experiences on this specific substance. What do you On think? Yeah. yeah. What do you think? Um, it's hard to say what I think because there's a lot of thoughts about that. Uh, I think so. You're saying that people, regardless of their background, are having like similar experiences when they're. So is this in context of like I know that there's some some problems and some merits to ayahuasca retreats. People are all in a collective space together in the trance together, even though they might be from different cultural backgrounds, they might be seeing similar things in the trance. Is this part of what you're asking about? Yeah. So there's a really interesting phenomenon called like an institutionalized trance. I wish we had time in this to talk about it. It's so fascinating. Um, people sometimes, there are many, many rituals in many parts of the world. Um, some examples are the Hauka in West Africa. This is something we don't probably want to show. Not everybody wants to see because this can sometimes be violent, but it's a reenactment. It's kind of reclaiming of... Uh, colonial trauma, it's a, it's a reprocessing of colonial trauma where people feel that they are possessed by um, those who were occupying them in the past. And in the context of the ritual, there are very, very specific actions for every role that everyone has to take on. They're not doing it consciously or on purpose, but in that ritual context, everyone's kind of in the same frame. Another example is Jatilan. It's a, a ritualized trance in Java, Indonesia. You're in the trance. When you're in the trance, you get into that trance not by taking anything, but just by being around others who are in this trance. You don't feel any pain. People are doing the same behaviors as each other. They can eat glass in the trance. They don't feel anything. They can get run over by a motorcycle, and this happens in the, in the ritual context. When you're outside of the ritual context, participants in Hauka and Jatilan don't tend to experience visions and voices. But in that context, people experience similar visions and voices to each other. I can't fully understand why it's similar, but sometimes being around somebody and, and seeing what they're experiencing, um, there's one model called the imitation and internalization model, by which people unconsciously internalize the behaviors or maybe even the thoughts of others around them. But it'd be something to look into. I hope that sort of answers the question. I can't thoroughly answer it because some, some things aren't explained. A uh, couple, I think you were first. Um, the last video we saw about the boy, um, do you think they considered the fact that his diet may have been contributing to his disorders? I mean, he kind of was smoking a cigarette right there and he was down in a bottle of coke. And yeah. could, they, could we also think that yeah. like maybe like, maybe his, his past experience may have affected him because he described stabbing and then the blood spilling like pig's blood. I, uh, yeah. Just based off the Inuit people, they think that kids learn based off of action. So could he have been exposed in three before, and then that's what led to these kind of behaviors? 
I don't think any of those hypotheses are explored in the film. And actually, without knowing this person personally, I can't I can't speak to that. I think there are probably some other folks in here who could speak to whether or not things like cigarette smoke and, and coke can contribute to things like Tourette syndrome. I, I can't speak to that. I'm sure it's not explored yourself. It's interesting that like those questions didn't come up. It was just mm -hmm. like, what do you think? Well, his environment has an effect on how it's the same subject. It's just very environment is very important. Where was, I think there's another question back there. Yes, go ahead. I had a couple. Uh, notably, I was going to ask, where can I hear more? You're an excellent presenter, and I liked your class so far. I'm guessing probably one of them. Um, in the spring, I have face-to-face -face classes you can sign up for. Uh, in October, start we have online courses, so you can sign up for ASP 214 and 102 address these topics, among others. I did, a, I did one other lesser question. Um, you had the one with the Yucatec. Maya, right? And the, uh, what is it, tenseless language. I'm guessing they're probably, probably bilingual, multilingual or something. I don't know. So, yeah, but they were, so a lot of the Yucatec Maya spoke Spanish, but were asked not to use Spanish at all in the experiments. They were only speaking Yucatec Maya to each other. Right. So, obviously, they still have to express that. But the structuring between the two people could be potentially explained by the structures of time, other time language time-based languages, kind of working its way in unspoken. But hand gestures stuff, right? So possibly using like grammatical constructions from Spanish, but in Yucatec Maya? Maybe. It's, it's one of those things where I was like, are they necessarily one language only? Because that would be obviously really hard to do. Right, that's a good question. They were not, most of them didn't only speak Yucatec Maya, but only spoke it in the experiment. So that would be something interesting to explore if any grammatical features from their second or third language is crept in. That's a good critical question. We should always be exploring these these critical questions and variables. Oh, I see a lot of I think I think that you were first and then Caitlin. That's a good question. Let me actually get back to that question then at the end. Let me wrap up with that. I love that question. Um, you were first. Go ahead. Um, when you have that dream presentation, could it possibly give us a foresight feeling about how dreams could present to us in the future in every various culture within the mind of us telling us something that something's possibly going to happen or just something mm -hmm. telling us? Oh, so people who have like premonitions through their dreams? Yeah, because some of the dreams I dream about, they're not even within the presentation, although the falling teeth out. That has happened before, but the water dream, I was swimming in the water, but I did not fall in the water. Oh, wow. And did it end up happening? No. No. No, not falling okay. in the water, but I was swimming okay. in the water. Wow. I bet that could be like a separate set of questions for those who have that gift of permission through their dreams. What kinds of patterns cross-culturally we see? That would be a really cool question. Yeah. We should explore. Uh, Caitlin. Okay, so one of the key elements of conservation to save... Uh, Keystone species such as in the northern rhino is to first work with the people because the rhino corn is used as medicine. Um, I also used to live in another country where it was popular to get over sickness is to eat the kidneys of an albino because that'll help save it. We also had someone who decided to uproot their life as a veterinarian because they had a dream, like Donna from God, that said they needed to then be chief of the people. Yes. At what point does colonization, like you don't want to colonize them and you want to respect their culture? But at what point do you respect their decisions, but also it's hurting the broad people? Is that just something that's based off of situation by situation? Or like how does cultural anthropology see that? That's a really salient question in cultural anthropology. I'm really glad you asked that. Um, sometimes we ask about the limits to our own cultural relativism, our own attitudes that all cultural ideologies and behaviors and beliefs are similarly valid when we see something that maybe is causing physical harm to somebody, for example, or to a, an animal species. Um, that's something that I think you're right, it's done case by case. If you're interested to look up the American Anthropological Association Code of Ethics, that 
I might give you some, it's, it's nice, they have a website, they have some ethical dilemmas, examples of how to think through things like that. I noticed that sometimes conservation efforts, not all the time, but sometimes ecological conservation efforts are prioritized above the sovereignty of indigenous groups in a lot of contexts. One example is in the, the Sundarbans in India, it's like the mangrove forest, biggest mangrove forest in the world. Uh, people are, the local people are no longer allowed to um, harvest honey, for example. Uh, so the tigers are getting to all the honey, and this is to conserve the bees, but that's been a traditional food source. And now it's getting to a point where there's, there's a danger to the local groups because tigers are attacking. So, the, the ability of local groups to still use the subsistence strategies and win relationship to the land they traditionally had was actually deprioritized to India's conservation efforts there. So it's really an intricate balance to have to keep in mind. I think you're right, case by case is important. And that's something very important to keep in mind. Great question. Who else did I see? Someone else's hand up. These are such good questions. Thank you guys, go ahead. Is there a difference between uh, cultural anthropology and cultural psychology? Yeah, I think some pretty significant differences and mostly that would come down to like our research methodologies. I think you all can probably answer this in the back. Do you use ethnographic methods? Probably some of you guys do use ethnographic methods quite a lot. I call it qualitative. Qualitative research. The extended periods of time spent understanding people's understandings. Um, you guys probably more use more quantitative research than we do as well. I think you guys have some balance sort of between the both. And you guys probably have some some more sophisticated understandings of what's really going on in the brain physically. I think that's not not totally the domain of cultural anthropology. So usually that's more a description of local narratives and local beliefs with cultural anthropology. Um, with cultural psychology, I think there's a lot of that. And also maybe some more quantitative work, maybe some more uh, neurology could be part of it. Probably your faculty back there could answer that better. That would be what, what I've experienced the difference being. But lots of overlap. So I'm glad you guys are here. Any more questions? Yes, one more, and then I'm going to answer why I chose to be a cultural anthropologist. In the Tepa study, you said that the people viewed time as east and west. In the Kuk Tyer language, yeah. Can you elaborate on that more, like, or expand on that more? Do they do it because of how the sun travels? Or they yes, that's part of that's part of the narrative as to why. Yeah. Um, in, in Aymara, has anyone heard of this language? It's a local language in South America. Time moves this way. So if I say, that's going to happen tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow's going to happen, tomorrow's time. And I say, that happened yesterday. Because <laughs> tomorrow, I can't see tomorrow. So <laughs> different local cosmologies, different descriptions. Okay, so I decided to be a cultural anthropologist. Uh, people ask me this, and I always say I wish I had a better story. I wish I remembered better. For some reason, I was so young when someone told me what cultural anthropology was, I actually do not remember the conversation. I remember that I was in middle school age, so I'm surprised that I don't remember. But I think it was a colleague, a teacher friend that my mom had, uh, or maybe it was my mom. Someone told me that they had learned about cultural anthropology and they thought this is the perfect field for you. I was very interested in reading books from all different cultures. I was just a little nerd kid. And when I learned more about it, I started taking community college classes when I was a high school student. And then I continued to take them after I graduated and then I transferred schools. When I first took an anthropology class, I really had the sense that anthropology is something that can help us sort of unite people. I said, I want to teach people about other people. When I was a kid, that was my goal. Now, as I've gotten further into the field, I realized this is kind of an idealistic way of looking at anthropology that doesn't really acknowledge the colonial past that anthropology has. A lot of times it's not just teaching people about other people. Who's teaching who about whom? Those power dynamics are really relevant. It's still very important to me to get to dis like sort of give these methods to people as tools that you can use no matter who you are to hopefully empower yourself in your community. Um, and I, I'm sure that our, your, my generation and your generation, all of the generations in this room have, have the power to do that. Um, so every class I took, I enjoyed, I didn't look back. I'm happy that I'm here. I'm happy that you guys are here. I don't think we all have to be cultural anthropologists. I love that when people take one class or two classes, and they go on to operationalize cultural anthropology as healthcare providers, as workers in social work or in technology, 
or as engineers or law as public advocates. That's that's really wonderful to see. I hope that answers your question. Thank you guys for the questions. <laughs>